previously on Forever Chemicals. We heard numerous accounts of how exactly PFAS are hazardous to our health and the environment, how they've polluted our water sources, and the scientific cover-ups that got us to where we are today. If I start with what is PFAS? PFAS is a very big group of fluororganic chemicals and polymers. They have what are called extraordinary properties. PFAS are industrial chemicals, and the carbon fluorine bond is perhaps the strongest in the periodic table. It takes the energy of lightning to break it. PFAS are known as forever chemicals. The chemical industry knew that PFAS could be harmful. So it's used in places that folks don't think. It's in every pizza box that you've gotten a pizza in. It's in your coffee cup at your favorite coffee joint around the corner. It's in cosmetics. You know, it's it's everywhere. PFAS chemicals are wreaking havoc on our health and environment. It's a really serious issue. So there's health impacts and there are environmental impacts. So many of them have been found to last essentially on geologic time. Difficult to remove, difficult to filter, and then once removed and filtered, difficult uh, to dispose of. They have been found to bioaccumulate in uh, people and animals and have been found in almost every living creature on Earth. We need to eliminate our apparent appetite for using PFAS. The environmental impacts are pretty potent. Many of us refer to these as forever chemicals. I think some of us need to reconsider, do I really need an extremely expensive fancy coat to go to my local coffee shop if it's raining a little bit. If I'm going to go on a hike in the woods in my community, do I need a jacket that performs just as well as hiking Mount Everest? I don't think so. I think most people would agree that you don't need that type of performance as an ordinary consumer. Despite all the lawsuits and regulations, PFAS continues to be a prevalent part of consumer products and manufacturing. My name is Ami Borenstein and really happy to be here today from Snaplink Consulting. At Snaplink, we focus on environmental, social, and related issues in the outdoor industry, the broader apparel industry, and other adjacent industries such as home furnishings, cosmetics, some software companies, consulting businesses, and far beyond. People use them because they are exceptionally high-performance chemicals. They work very, very well at what they do. Primarily, they're designed as uh, coatings or as films. They resist heat, they resist oil, they resist grease, they resist water, and they bond very tightly. And so the combination of factors makes them really exceptional for things like nonstick pans. You know, they're low friction, they're thermally stable. And in the outdoor industry, the most common uses are in a film structure, which, you know, is, is referred to as a floor polymer and some of the older versions of Gore-Tex are made from that. And then there's non-polymer types, which are generally a liquid chemistry in the outdoor industry and used as a durable water repellency on the exterior of almost all performance outerwear, as has been the case for probably the last 30 years. In addition to where we already talked about, ski wax is pretty common as well. So hard goods haven't gotten out unscathed. And then beyond that, we're seeing them in home furnishings, we're seeing them in carpets, seeing them in rugs, in food packaging, like those compostable clamshell containers, pizza boxes, cosmetics, shampoo, menstrual products. I'm reading from my very long list, toilet paper, dental floss, and I could go on, but I won't. Basically, they're incredibly pervasive. Again, as a class of chemicals, they're exceptionally high performance. And so many, many uses have been found for them across industry. The challenge and the reason we're here today is, you know, the health effects have now been discovered to be pretty uh, detrimental. In episode three of Forever Chemicals, we give an overview of how PFOS is used in modern day production. If this is your first time listening, I suggest going back to the beginning and listening to the first two episodes to get a full picture of the PFOS problem. In the first two episodes, we learned how PFAS migrates around the globe and some of the health concerns involved with exposure to these hazardous chemicals. If this is known and has been known for decades, why are they still being used? You know, 3M, interestingly, was a stout defender of PFAS for literally decades. In fact, they continue to question scientific evidence that shows that PFAS can be dangerous, even at incredibly low levels of exposure. Yet 3M has agreed to phase out production of PFAS by, I believe, 2025. 
So historically, 3M was one of the biggest producers of PFAS in the US and the world. They are now phasing out its production. This is something they honestly should have done decades ago, especially when they began to phase out the long chain PFAS and said they started producing other PFAS chemicals that are in many cases just as persistent and in some cases just as toxic or even more toxic. Unfortunately, other chemical producers like Camores and Daikin have not yet followed suit. So we think companies like Camores and Daikin need to step up and join 3M and commit to phase out the production of PFAS, especially when we know there are safer alternatives available. The ones that have been shown to be toxic are no longer used, but changing things has gotten so much harder. In those days, we determined that the flame retardant that was 5 to 10% of the weight of all kids' pajamas in the 70s, that it was a mutagen, it changed DNA, and we showed that it got into the children. And three months later, it was banned from use and stopped being used. And nowadays, you know, it can be years of struggling because the chemical industry really fights back. I would say it took the outdoor industry a really long time to recognize that PFAS was a problem. I don't think they recognized it until California banned PFAS from textiles, and then they recognized it because they had to. It's much harder now to get these changes than it was in the beginning. There's movement away from PFAS, and we will discuss this in more detail in the next episode. However, that hasn't stopped chemical companies from finding loopholes to include PFAS in their production. What they do then is they have joint ventures with producers in China. So they say we don't produce anymore and they produce in China. China is a, one of the biggest producers in the world of PFAS products and their biggest customer is South America. If you put a, a map with the most regulated parts in the world, and you put a map above that with the least PFAS using or tolerant countries, you get a quite good match here. I wouldn't say that South America is lawless or China, but they have a different perspective on PFAS. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> I've read the regulatory work that some even think that PFAS is non-toxic without any evidence. So whatsoever, a bit too much, I guess. Not only is there pushback from chemical companies, but it seems that PFAS, as a class of chemicals, is impossible to beat in terms of performance, especially in the outdoor industry. My name is Alex Laver. I'm the Senior Director of Materials Innovation and Sustainability at Outdoor Research. I think the most prevalent use where people will see it first is in rainwear, because this chemical is really good at what it was invented to do, which is have stuff not stick to it, right? The Teflon was sort of the original invention here with PFAS. It's used in rainwear. It's what makes the water bead on the surface of your jacket, which many consumers would say my jacket is or is not waterproof because water is beading on the surface. That is one very important part of keeping a garment waterproof and keeping you comfortable in said garment but it's not necessarily the most critical or important part in terms of the waterproofness. In most cases, that beading and DWR, durable water repellency, is actually more important to keeping you breathable and comfortable in that waterproof garment versus actually waterproof. I think that's the most visible, but it's used in so many other places. It's used pretty often in down garments, insulated and puffy pieces, and some of that could be for a little bit of weather resistance. Some of it could be to repel, especially with fluorinated versions, oils down as a natural product. And in some cases, you can get a little bit of oil contamination from the down and it keeps it to the inside and doesn't bleed through your expensive, awesome, super colorful puffy. That's used in swimwear very often in terms of quick dry. During the prevalence of, and growth of high stretch board shorts, et cetera, they get really saggy when they get wet. You know, you kind of get that feeling they're dragging on your body. They would apply a DWR to keep them from absorbing water. High spandex content, women's swimwear frequently has DWR treated to it to resist that. The oleophobicity, it's a big word, but it means oil resistance. The oleophobicity of C6 treatments is great in swimwear because guess what we're all going to experience in the near future? You're going to get stains in your swimwear and your sun hoodies from sunscreen. It's oil-based. So it's used in places that folks don't think. And 
you know, I'm not throwing hammers necessarily, but it's in every pizza box that you've gotten a pizza in. It's that sheet of paper that keeps the pizza from falling through your box. It's in your coffee cup at your favorite coffee joint around the corner. I won't name names because it's that coating that keeps it from bleeding through the paper. It's in cosmetics. It's everywhere. And I think at the high level, that is what's driving some of the legislative action being taken of outright full product bans versus something more, say, targeted and specific. Additionally, the complexity of PFAS as a class of chemicals continues to complicate how and where it's used in production, making moving into regulatory policy difficult to streamline. We also need to understand that are these PFAS used on the market? I think that's the very hard thing, because you have more than 10,000 PFAS substances, and we still don't know every version of chemical of PFAS are actually used on the market. Because we have this generic approach. And of course, asking the industry is not very helpful. So we don't know really. There is a requirement in the Stout Convention that has to be some sort of industrial production and use on the market. And we cannot prove that for all kinds of PFAS. I think that's the biggest challenge to get a global listing. While it seems that a lot of PFAS are ending up in our consumer products, they're also used widely in the production of materials themselves, which can lead to contamination of products that were never intended to contain PFAS in the first place. PFAS is used throughout the supply chain. It's sometimes difficult to find exactly where PFAS is introduced because it's so pervasive in our environment. PFAS are known as forever chemicals because so many of them have been found to last essentially on geologic time. They don't break down naturally in the environment. The other signatures of the chemical are that they're highly mobile, meaning they move through the environment, they spread. They can also pool up. Some of them attract each other and they hold together into these plumes. They can move through water, they can move through soil. They're highly mobile chemicals. As a result, we seem every week to find them in new places. I think only a few weeks ago, I saw some headlines that they had been found in penguin nests. There's been research finding them in polar bears, research finding them at base camp on Mount Everest, in rainwater, and in 90-something percent of Americans' blood. It's difficult to find a place that doesn't have PFAS. As a result, PFAS contamination can arise throughout a supply chain both through those inadvertent methods, but also through the purposeful use of PFAS throughout the supply chain, whether it's at the beginning of the supply chain with raw materials, trying to create water resistant materials or membranes or any number of other materials that are useful in the supply chain to the manufacturing process themselves. PFAS are used as a, a mold release, are used in dyes, are used in coloring methods, are used as lubricants in gaskets in any number of potential applications. There are some pretty excellent papers out there trying to categorize the uses of PFAS in any number of industries. There's a use for PFAS if you name the product set. There are so many different ways that PFAS could be introduced to a product, and then ultimately, at the end of life, it will be there. The focus of this podcast is largely the use of PFAS in the outdoor industry, but I would be remiss if I did not explore the vast use of these chemicals in products and how they got here. One company that we haven't mentioned that has played a big role in PFAS pollution, specifically in the United States, is Enhanced Technologies. Investigated by Bloomberg News, their journalists took a look at PFAS pollution in Easton, Massachusetts, and the Hockamock Swamp. As communicated in their investigative documentary, Why Forever Chemicals Are Still Spreading, they learned that pesticides used to spray for mosquitoes, the Anvil 1010, were transported in fluorinated plastic containers that leached PFOA into the pesticides. In March of 2022, the EPA requested that enhanced technologies stop the use of PFOA in their plastics, but they initially declined. Their plastics are used in other brand products, such as BMWs, L'Oreal, some cosmetics, and a variety of weed killers. Unfortunately, the EPA has no regulatory authority over products like cosmetics, but they can and do regulate pesticides. Eventually, regulations from the EPA and the EU caught up to enhanced technologies, and they announced that they are working on phasing out all PFAS chemistries from their products. 
What's more surprising about this story is that PFOA is one of the very first PFOS chemicals that became well studied and known for its health impacts. They have also, at the US EPA, calculated using standard methodologies, and they have found that the toxicity of PFOS and PFOA is only as slightly less than dioxin, which is the most toxic human-made chemical ever made. So these are very close to that. And if you want the comparison, then EPA developed limits for the concentration of these compounds in drinking water that would be acceptable according to these calculations. And those levels are about 1% of the limit that has been approved in the European Union. So we're really looking at chemicals that are toxic at extremely low concentrations, and we are way behind in securing that people are not exposed to levels that can be toxic and cause adverse health effects. It is a little bit overwhelming when I think about PFAS in production. It is seemingly everywhere, and it feels a little bit unavoidable for the average consumer. It's in our rain jackets, ski wax, zippers, contacts, floss, and many other unnecessary things. That overwhelm is part of what inspired me to make this podcast. I wanted to know how and why we got here, and what we can do about it moving forward. Throughout my interview process with various guests you've already heard from, and others in future episodes, I recognize themes such as brands or suppliers that would come up in conversations often. One of the brands that came up in almost every one of my interviews was W.L. Gore and Associates. One of the laggards that has not yet moved is Gore. Gore has produced Gore-Tex, which is made from PFAS chemicals, from PTFE, also known as Teflon. And to their credit, Gore has recently, as of a couple of years ago, introduced a new PFAS-free membrane to replace the PFAS membrane that they historically have offered their customers. Yet Gore continues to use PFAS in other applications, both in membranes and also in DWR applications. And Gore, of course, is a key supplier in the outdoor industry. And while they say that they are reducing PFAS of environmental concern, that's kind of an oxymoron. Honestly, all PFAS are of environmental concern because they're incredibly persistent. They don't go away. They can last or persist in the environment for decades, possibly hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. So we really need manufacturers, companies like Gore and chemical manufacturers like Comores to step up and join the growing market and corporate social responsibility trend away from PFAS. This is not only the right thing to do for our health and for our environment, but we also think it makes good business sense for companies like Gore. Increasingly, we're seeing that people in the outdoor industry that hike, like myself, we want to know that the products that we buy for our families are safe for not only us, but also for the communities and the workers where the products are made. And we don't want to buy gear that can leave behind a toxic trail of pollution that can contaminate the outdoor environment that we cherish. So I will say a lot of the PFAS, say in Gore-Tex, is mostly polymeric. That's a big molecule. So a lot of the problem is the manufacturer. However, there can be monomers, small molecules mixed with the big molecules, you know, so will your Gore-Tex jacket make you ill? The answer is probably not, but you know, don't buy another one unless Gore-Tex reformulates to not use PFAS. I think they are doing that now. As Arlene mentioned, yes, Gore reformulated their waterproof membrane. And while Gore declined an interview for this podcast, they did provide me with some resources from their website explaining their new EPE lining. In an email from a Gore representative, they stated, quote, Each material in our product portfolio offers a combination of unique properties and delivers exceptional value to the user. Our extensive materials offering enables us to provide our consumer with a variety of textile solutions that deliver the comfort and protective needs of the end user. To do this, currently our primary materials are based in either EPTFE or our newest membrane, the EPE membrane. 
introduced in 2022, and made from our expanded polyethylene. The EPE membrane provides waterproof, windproof breathability and durability benefits that consumers request from us, combined with the reduced carbon footprint and is made from expanded polyethylene, without intentionally added per or polyfluorinated substances. EPTFE offers a high degree of protection in any scenario, including those that require highly specialized protection found in some personal protective gear. As noted above, Gore uses a fluoropolymer, EPTFE, for the thin, waterproof, and breathable membrane at the heart of many Gore-Tex products. While PTFE does meet the broad definition of PFAS, there are significant distinctions between the chemical of the physical properties of fluoropolymers like PTFE and other materials often associated with the term PFAS. For example, PTFE is insoluble in water, durable, and extremely stable. In addition, we believe PTFE meets the definition of a polymer of low concern, as defined by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. In addition, when speaking about the broad group of per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, it is important to note, given the variety of chemistries, not all PFAS are the same. The category's chemistries are as different and varied as their end use, making it an incredibly complex topic. As a company rooted in science-based innovation, Gore believes it's important to consider the distinct differences in chemical and physical properties through the lens of science and, as such, should be evaluated and regulated as distinct subgroups and not under the collective grouping of all PFAS." End quote. The membrane substrate of W.L. Gore and others, but W.L. Gore, that's the one they've had forever, is that PFAS. And my answer is usually fairly quick and direct. I don't care if it is or it isn't. The fact of the matter is it fails the test that the state of California and other states are looking at and adopting now, but they were one of the first. It fails the test that they established in the law for whether or not your products were compliant. So whether it is or isn't a PFAS, it's illegal. I can't sell it. We have to remember that the fluorochemistry is not only PFAS, it's also PFC. The climate change gases also had the F gases. Someone said the F, not, not that word I said. The fluorine gases, they have also to be considered because they are a real threat to the global warming. And you produce greenhouse gases when you produce fluoropolymers because some of them are auxiliary chemicals in the fluoropolymer production. So when a company says we use PTFE, they actually contribute to the emissions of greenhouse gases in the fluoropolymer production. In researching Gore and their use of EPTFE through their product categories, phrases like, quote, polymers of low concern, or phrases like, quote, it does not degrade to become a source of PFCs of environmental concern, are used widely throughout their website and in marketing campaigns. In a 2022 report put out by the NRDC, going out of fashion, U.S. apparel manufacturers must eliminate PFOS from supply chains. They overviewed a survey conducted of the 30 top U.S.-based apparel companies to see how they use PFAS and how they plan to phase them out. There are two main takeaways from that survey relevant to the outdoor industry. First, the outdoor industry lags behind consumer values in PFAS policy. Second, many brands use misleading definitions of PFAS, leading to confusion among consumers. A quote from that study reads, Patagonia received the highest grades of all the outdoor apparel brands surveyed for having established a timeline to eliminate use of PFAS in its supply chain in the future. However, the remaining U.S. brands within the outdoor apparel sector received surprisingly low grades despite the environmental and public health concerns of many of their consumers. REI, VF Corp, parent of the North Face, Timberland, Jansport, and others, and L.L. Bean, for instance, received grades of D, or F, for incomplete commitments that excluded some PFAS or for long timelines for phase-out. European outdoor apparel companies, Jack Wolfskin, Houdini, and Vod, and outdoor textile suppliers, PolarTech, have eliminated PFAS from their supply chains, demonstrating that it can be done and the U.S. brands are delaying unnecessarily. Many companies use outdated, inaccurate, or misleading definitions of PFAS in their commitments and communications regarding the chemicals. These outdated definitions can result in consumer confusion around whether these products they purchase contain PFAS. For instance, companies should cease 
from using the label PFCs free of environmental concern if their products contain any PFAS because it's falsely suggesting some PFAS are not of environmental concern, unquote. Since this survey was conducted in 2022, I am curious to see what the results would be now with the impending regulation of PFAS just around the corner. The reason I bring up this survey is because it brings attention to something prevalent in the way companies talk about PFAS in their products, greenwashing. PFAS is a confusing topic that is easily to muddle or misconstrue. Providing ample marketing opportunities for brands that wish to continue to manufacture with PFAS while still looking environmentally responsible to their consumers. Numerous papers published oftentimes appear as defensive. They are essentially concluding that, oh, we don't know for sure, so it's too early to ban PFAS. I mean, this is what, what it says between the lines and the conclusions. But I think that when we see papers published with the support of the PFAS production or usage industry, that we have to be a little careful. If you want to be making sustainability claims about your products, about your company, you will want to make sure that you have the backing to make that claim, what we call substantiation. In one study widely cited by chemical companies and other industries was conducted by W.L. Gore and Associates, alongside Camors, previously DuPont. That study is titled, A Critical Review of the Application of Polymers of Low Concern and Regulatory Criteria to Floral Polymers. After consulting with chemists qualified to peer review such a study, I learned that if we ignore several parts of the floral polymer cycle, then polymers of low concern can be true. However, there are substantial emissions of small PFAS substances in production, such as precursors, TFA and similar, emulsifiers such as perfluorinated polyether salts, which used to be ammonium salt of PFOA. It is suspected that the ammonium salt of PFHXA is currently used as an emulsifier in the production of fluoropolymers such as PTFE. In the waste phase, there are challenges with microplastics from fluoropolymers. During incineration from 1200 to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit or 700 to 800 degrees Celsius, small PFAS are formed and emitted into the environment. So polymers of low concern depends if you cherry pick the life cycle of fluoropolymers. What's particularly concerning about Gore's definition of EPTFE as a low concern in marketing, as well as published scientific papers, is that there is currently a class action lawsuit against them in Maryland due to the pollution of these chemicals. Baird Mondalis Brockstead and Frederico LLC and Motley Rice LLC are co-consuls on this case, and their website states, quote, For nearly four decades, manufacturer W.L. Gore and Associates used toxic polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFOS, also known as Forever Chemicals, at its Cherry Hill plant in Elkton, Maryland. When prompted by the Environmental Protection Agency in 2006, Gore agreed to phase out use of certain PFOS chemicals by the end of 2015. As recently as February 2, 2022, however, Gore was on record opposing legislative efforts to place restrictions on PFOS in Maryland, arguing the current definition of PFOS chemicals is overly broad and should not include EPTFE. People who live and work near Gore's Cherry Hill plant allege that the company contaminated their groundwater, surface water, and soil when it dumped chemical wastewater and released large plumes of PFOS vapors into the air. They allege that as a result, their surrounding community has been and continues to be exposed to toxic chemicals that persist in the environment and increase the risk of harm to health." Unquote. As a physician, with my insight into the adverse effects of these compounds, I would say we need to, number one, eliminate our apparent appetite for using PFASs for a very large number of purposes where they are not really all that necessary and where substitutes can be developed. We need to do that. And then we also need to figure out a way that we can pay for to remove the PFASs from the environment and help people decrease exposures because we don't have any medical techniques to help people who have accumulated a high concentration of these compounds in the body. And clearly, the companies that are responsible for the contamination should certainly pay a price for this. 
and how that should be done, <laughs> I'm not sure. But certainly, I believe this is a huge priority in human health. Most of us likely know Gore for their Gore-Tex lining, but they're also producers and suppliers for several other industries and product categories. In my research for this podcast, I learned that their chemistry can be found in items like floss, electrical tape, and a variety of electronics, and much more. So yes, it seems the consensus is that Gore is moving in the right direction with their EPE lining as the new Gore-Tex. But what does that mean for the rest of their products? Will Gore or any other chemical company ever truly be PFOS free? Will we continue to value performance over the planet and human health? Is there truly a necessary use for PFOS in the outdoor industry and beyond? In the next episode, we'll take a look at the answers to these questions and how regulations have shifted most companies away from PFOS altogether. If you want to learn more about what PFOS are, where they're found, the proven health effects, how you can limit your exposure, up-to-date news on PFOS, and how to get involved in PFOS regulatory efforts, visit toxicfreefuture.org, foodandwaterwatch.org, or pfoscentral.org. SnapLink Consulting provided expert fact-checking and guidance for the creation of this podcast. SnapLink Consulting provides corporate sustainability strategies and ESG support across a broad range of industries, including apparel, footwear, home furnishings, software, cosmetics, professional services, and more. Head to snaplinkconsulting.com to learn more and contact the experts to guide you through complex topics like CSRD, PFOS, greenhouse gas assessments, SBTI, CDP, Ecovadis, B Corp, and many more compliance and certification frameworks. Forever Chemicals is a Black-Footed Ferret production. All the source material for this episode can be found in the show notes or at theoutdoorminimalist.com forward slash forever chemicals. As an independent podcast, we rely on listener support as our primary avenue for funding. If you like this show and our other content, consider donating to our GoFundMe. The link is in the show notes.